Okie dokie. Continue. Go ahead. Good evening and welcome to our collaborative storytelling show. I hope you're ready for an hour and a half of some great stories. I know I am. My name's Gary Hartman and I will be your master of ceremonies. This is a collaboration between storytellers from Fireside Storytelling League and Word Weavers Toastmasters. This is our second time we've done a collaborative show this year. First one was in March. Everyone seemed to like it so much, we decided to do it again before everyone heads back outdoors for the summer. <clears throat> so to start off, I'd like to introduce our first storytelling storyteller this evening, Larry Crack. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Organizer MC. or whatever you are yeah, tonight, MC. Mr. MC. Larry is a professional storyteller, author, and inspirational speaker. He has written 17 books, although I'd still like to get an autographed copy of one of them. <laughs> a consummate Toastmaster, distinguished Toastmaster, in fact. Larry, Larry created the Northwest Comedy Club in 2019, which is a specialty Toastmasters club where he teaches humor and, of course, storytelling. So, ladies and gentlemen, Larry Crack. Thank you. My title is... Uh, the Salmon of Knowledge. And I think several of you have heard this one before. And to set the stage, this is actually a river in Ireland. But we're going to go way back into ancient Ireland. When it was ruled by feudal chieftains, they, they weren't very big villages. They had fortresses of timber. In fact, at one time, Ireland is all timber. And they weren't very big people. If they even made four foot five or four foot 10, but they were tough, and they were mean, and they were always fighting. Aren't the Irish still fighting today? Oh, oh I better not tell that my wife, but yes. So during one of these fights, there was a chieftain, his name was Craig Derrick. And he was out making trouble with all the rest of the neighboring villages, or you might say. And once you know it, he got clonked over the head with a sword and boom, down he went. Well, his people, they ran back to the fortress, his fortress. And he told Fiona, they told Fiona, the queen, Oh, Craig Derrick, he has got his head bashed. He's dead. Oh, and Fiona knew that the rest of the people were going to come after her. And she they had a young son named Finn. And they were going to kill Finn. That's what they always did. They always killed all the kids that were next in lineage to get rid of them. It was a nasty time back then. Oh, Fiona, she was beside herself. So she took one of her attendants aside and says, please take the young child and take him to the River Boyne where there is the poet Finnegan and have Finnegan raise the young child. Quickly, get on the horse, take the youngster and take some jewels with you and don't tell anybody where Finn is. Someday, maybe he'll survive and have a more genteel lifestyle than this fighting back and forth. So the attendant took the young boy, who was about eight or nine years old, in the middle of the night and headed out across the bogs and over the hedges, over the stone walls, over hill and over dale, till they come to the river Boyne to Finnegan's stone hut. Now in those days, the poets were the professors. They were the college. They taught everybody everything. And Finnegan was the best. So the tenant came to the 
to the stone hut, bam, on the door. Open up, Finnegan, open up. Well, Finnegan, he gets up. He's a gruff old guy, and he says, what's up? What do you want to do with me? We have a young, I have a young man here that uh, his father just got slain, and he needs to be sheltered and taught all the arts. Oh, why do you bring me the lad? It just makes me mad. Everybody brings all, everybody that's sad brings me all of their stuff. Well, the tenant says, well, how about if I gave you a few jewels? Would that change your mind? Well, it did change his mind. Very well, bring the lad inside. Now, Finnegan, he was after one thing in life, his only pursuit, and that was a salmon that lived in the pool on the river Boyne below his stone hut. And above the pool also grew a hazelnut tree with magic nuts. And when those would drop into the water, this salmon would come up, gulp them, and go back down. Now, the, as the legend goes, the salmon had all the knowledge of the world. It was a silver thing, sparkly. You could see it flitting and swimming down in the shallows there. And whoever caught that salmon and roasted it and had the first bite would get all the knowledge in the world. And since Finnegan was one of the wisest and smartest poets, he felt like he deserved that that was going to be his. He was possessed every day he's out there fishing. He didn't even take those, take a, when it, they were ripe, the hazelnuts, he would take those and those hazelnuts and he would carve them into little minnows or little butterflies or little insects and he'd put them on a hook and see if he could entice the salmon but that time, that salmon was smart well finnegan took finn underhand and he told him to sweep the floors and shut the doors and what more do i have to tell you Poor little Finn, he just worked and worked and worked, but he learned a lot from the poet. Usually on the equinox, the winter equinox, the summer equinox was when, on the full moon, is when the salmon was very active and very hungry. It got to be about the spring, spring equinox and you could see the salmon down there swirling around, getting just like they do today. You know, they come up the rivers here and get all excited. And of course, Finnegan, he was getting all excited too. Well, one day as he's fishing, he had to, he got the call of nature and he uh, had to go really bad. So he told the young Finn, you take my pole and uh, mind the pole because I got to go find the hole. He was always speaking in poets. <laughs> and so the young Finn said, oh, yeah, okay, I'll do this. So young oh. Finn, he was through a, a hazelnut carved like a minnow down there and whew, up comes that salmon. Oh, Finn was so excited. He pulled that right out of the water. Oh, this fishing is fun. I like doing this. Instead of, I don't like cleaning house for that old man, old bachelors, they're terrible to clean house, but well, he thought he'd throw that little carved minnow carved out of a hazelnut into the middle of the pool, and wouldn't you know, that salmon came up, and it grabbed that hazelnut, and he's gone, and he was yelling, fish on, fish on, well, all down, from around the bush, here comes Finnegan with his pants half down, and he just, ah, ah, get me that pole, young lad, out of the way, he reeled and reeled, and he fought, and he fought, now, there's one thing you have to remember, is that 
you don't look the salmon in the eye or you're paralyzed temporarily. And Finnegan, well, he, he retired, he tried hard, but he, and the salmon was tiring and he was tiring. He almost had it up to shore and ooh, he, salmon saw him right in the eyeball. And, oh, he was getting paralyzed. He could feel his limbs stiffening. Take the pole, boy, take the pole, lad. I don't know, I gotta go lay down. So Finnegan, Finn, he just reeled and reeled and he got that fish in, that salmon, he got it up on the shore and it was flopping around and and he knocked it out. There's that beautiful, beautiful silvery salmon. He ran up to the hut. Oh, master, oh, master, I got the fish, I got the fish. Well, Finnegan, he says, okay roast it over the coals don't use a foal or anything like that uh and don't take a bite save it for me i'll be okay in an hour or so so finn knew how to roast things over a spit so he cleaned the salmon out and shoved the rod through the tail through the mouth and he Got the fire going and slowly turned that fish until it was perfect. However, there was a big bubble just below the, the flesh, the, below the skin. And that's what salmon do. They, the, the fat rises and it makes bubbles. And oh, Finn, he really wanted a perfect fish for Finnegan. Well, he didn't think. So he took his fingernail and he reached down ever so carefully and popped that bubble that had fat underneath. Of course, the fat came out and splashed his finger. Ah, oh, and what do young boys do? Oh, ow, 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 ow. All of a sudden, his eyes started twirling. He could feel things going around in his head. There was tingly. Oh, he thought he was poisoned. Something was happened miraculously, but he kept going. And soon Finnegan kind of stumbled out of the stone hut. How's the fish? Do you have my wish? Yes, master. Yes, master. Here, I'll put a piece on a board and let you have it. So he cut off a slab and gave it to Finnegan and Finnegan sat down on a stone and he took a bite and he was waiting for the miraculous transformation. Didn't happen, something was wrong. Looked at the lad, lad, did you steal my wish? Did you eat my fish? No, 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 master. No, I didn't. I didn't. I promise I didn't. There's something different about you. You're kind of blue. Oh, no, no, no. I promise. Tell me, what did happen? Well, young Finn confessed that he popped the blister and the fat burned his thumb and he sucked his thumb and something happened inside of his head. Oh, alas is me. I don't know what will be. It is predestinated. I know that it will go to somebody else. And that is you, young Finn, that you have gotten the all the knowledge of the world. See, whoever would take the first bite of the fish would get the wish and get all the knowledge. What more can I teach you? I have no more. You are wiser than I now. Be gone, lad. Well, young Finn was, uh, he was up in the 13 or 14 years old now. So he packed his bag and he headed on down the road. And the first village he came to, there's 
men of discontent because they always were fighting against the government way back then. And he collected them, come along with me. We're going to have an adventure. And village to village, so this, from here to there, he collected all these great warriors. He trained them. He had all the knowledge. And when it come time to be, he settled down and built his own fortress. And then he started fighting and clonking people over the head. But he wasn't so ruthless to go burn the other ones down. He kind of made a confederation. But then he had all this over his head and whatever. And he basically unified Ireland way back then. The man Finn. But the moral of the story is, folks, I want to tell you this right now, is watch those salmon. You know, salmon's good. But if you get a magical salmon, I wouldn't be eating any of that flesh i would give it to somebody else because as you know i don't think any of you would want to be president today mr mc you'll have to matt uh please unmute your dad i think you're handling that where'd matt go matt went all right, <laughs> all right. thank you larry <laughs> all right our next storyteller is eileen beck eileen is a veteran toastmaster and an accomplished public speaker of late she's ventured into the arena of more traditional storytelling she's a teacher she's a nurse and you'll still <laughs> Storyteller, ladies and gentlemen, Eileen Beck. Right. Well, thank you, Gary. I grew up on an apple farm, and what I loved every year were the apple blossoms. The apple blossoms also had a great aroma. They were beautiful. The problem was the apple blossoms would leave. I thought, though, apple blossoms were magical because when the apple blossom left, it left behind a small stick and a round top. And that small stick and round top became a large, beautiful apple just like this. As a matter of fact, I was reminded that the blossom was once here. So apple blossoms to me are magical. However, I have a friend who lived on an orange grove. And from stories I've heard, Orange blossoms are much more magical than any apple blossom I ever knew. So once upon a time and not that long ago, in the valley of an orange grove lived Mr. Sakura and his wife and daughter. Mr. Sakura loved his farm on the orange grove. The trees were beautiful, especially when they were in blossom. And of course, after the blossoms left, which was sad because they were so beautiful, they left behind some great oranges, the biggest, juiciest oranges you have ever seen. This was fantastic for the Sakura family because they could sell these oranges and make a living. The Sakuras felt that they belonged here. Now, their daughter, of course, belonged there because she was born in this area. However, Mr. Sakura, excuse me, Mr. Sakura and Mrs. Sakura were from the land of the flowering cherry trees in the shadows of Mount Fuji. Now, flowering cherry blossoms are the greatest ever. However, when they're gone, they're gone. There's no fruit that's left behind. Mr. and Mrs. Sakura needed to make a living. So the orange grove was the best for them. Mr. Sakura belonged in this area, at least he felt he did because he had papers proving he belonged in the Valley of the Orange Groves. Mrs. Sakure also felt she belonged there, but she had papers. Uh, where were those papers though? The neighbors thought the Sakures belonged there. So that was good enough for them. One little problem. In the land of the flowering cherry trees, under the shadow of Mount Fuji, the emperor thought everything belonged to him. He thought that the land of the orange groves belonged to him. 
The land of the golden wheat belonged to him. The land of the movie stars and their houses belonged to him. The land of the coal mines belonged to him. He even felt that the land of the polar bears belonged to him. Now why he won the land of the polar bears beats me, but he thought it belonged to him. He was creating all sorts of little whirlwinds and, and storms and, and kind of wars. Right now, he was creating a little whirlwind in the land of spices and gorgeous silk. Everyone was beginning to be afraid of this emperor. And they didn't really, if they felt that someone looked like this emperor, they were with this emperor. Unfortunately, well, no, I shouldn't say unfortunately, but Mr. and Mr. Sakura looked like the emperor, so did their daughter. Now the neighbors felt there's no problem with the Sakuras. They're, they're great farmers, they're great people. Let's not worry about them. But other people were uh, suspicious of the Sakuras. So Mrs. Sakura, since she couldn't find her papers, went back to the land of the flowering cherry trees under the shadows of Mount Fuji with her daughter, started looking for those papers. But about that time, the emperor started another big catastrophic storm. It was a land of paradise, of sandy beaches and pineapples and some big ships. And for a guy who wanted that place, he really destroyed the heck out of it. Now everybody was scared and frightened. Mrs. Sakura had to stay in the land of the flowering cherry trees and in the shallows of Mount Fuji with her daughter. The emperor knew that she came to the land of the orange groves and maybe she had some secrets. He would send his soldiers there quite often to see if she had secrets of the land of the orange groves. She was scared. Mr. Sakura was back by the orange groves. However, and he was, people were frightened of him too. He looked too much like the emperor. So many people, they thought he belonged out in the desert with the cacti and the Gila monsters. They thought he did not belong in the land of the orange groves. He did not belong there. So they took Mr. Sakura off to the desert and they said, well, you're not gonna need this farm anymore. We're gonna sell it on you. Mm. Well, the farm people and the neighbors of the Sakuras were just were very, very sad. They go, oh, this is horrible. And one evening they were looking at the gorgeous orange blossoms, but they were feeling so bad for the Sakaris. And then all of a sudden a little whirlwind popped up. Now it wasn't one that was sent by the emperor, it was just one of those natural little whirlwinds and it blew all the orange blossoms off. Well, this made everyone even sadder. We have no orange blossoms, no Sakaris. How could things get worse? Now there is Skip. Skip Angelino, he only read comic books. So who paid attention to him? But Skip said, what's, so, what's the big deal of all you guys worried about? This, the orange blossoms are gonna be back next season and so will the Sakaris. And everyone looked at Skip and they said, hey, Skip, you are unrealistic. They knew he only had his face in the funny papers and never in the newspapers. But Skip says, well, I know I'm half right. The orange blossoms are coming back. And why can't the Sakuras come back too? So because the orange blossoms got into their hair, got down their shirts and in their pockets, they started pulling all those orange blossoms out. And then they got to thinking, well, you know, Skip might be right. He isn't most of the time, but this time he might be. All the townspeople, as they're picking out all that stuff from their hair, from inside their shirt and from their pockets, they went down to this big hall with a big table. And that's where some magic happened. I'm gonna go back to the magic in just a minute. Now the leader of the land of the orange groves and the movie stars and the polar bears, et cetera, he decided he had enough of that emperor and all of his storms. The leader of the land, made two big horrendous storms. And he threw them both at the land of the emperor. The storms were horrible. They destroyed land, they destroyed people. Many people were so sick after that. And that was very, very sad. However, uh, some good came from it. The emperor said, I am tired of storms myself. I'm not gonna put out, give anyone else any more storms. 
you quit giving me storms. He says, I no longer want the land of the orange groves. I no longer want the land of the movie stars. Who wants them anyway? And I certainly don't want the land of the polar bears. I'm out of there. Well, this was great. And the second good thing, people could come back to where they belong or where they felt they belong. Mr. and Mrs. Sakura started coming back to the land of the orange groves, but they, they, they felt they belonged there, but they didn't. Their, their house was sold. Their farm was sold. Well, they knew someone took some of their furniture to save it for them. Hey, maybe we'll just grab our furniture and start anew someplace else. So the Socorres went to the Angelinos because the Angelinos knew everything because Skip was around. And they said, you know, where's our furniture? We need to pack it up and go someplace else. And Mr. Angelino said, oh, it's in your house. And Mr. Socorre said, oh, it's no longer a house, it's been sold. Mr. Angelino says, go back there, go, go to your house and see what's there. Well, Mr. and Mrs. Sakari and their daughter found the furniture was still in place in their house. The house looked great, and so the farm. But Mr. Sakari said, uh, you know, this isn't our house anymore. Uh, what's happening here? And Mr. Sakari says, no, this is still your house. And Mr. Sakari says, I, I don't understand. Well, Mr. Angelino said, you know, maybe there's a little magic. I don't know if it's the orange blossoms or what. But one day we were feeling so bad for you. We all got together and sat around the table and we put out a few plans. We threw out some, some questions. We made some strategies. We, and we looked at it and we asked each other questions. And then we put our heads into it. We put our hearts into it. And we also found that we put some of our pocket money into it too. And we bought your farm. And Mr. Sakura said, wow, I, I just can't believe it. How come you did that to us? And Mr. Sakura said, no, excuse me, Mr. Angelino says, we did it because you belonged here. And he goes, and by the way, Mr. Sakura, what does Sakura mean? Me and the missus are kind of brushing up on Japanese so we know what's happening. And we just always wonder what Sakura meant. And Mr. Sakura said, blossom. Thank you. All right, thank you, Eileen. Our next speaker is Roxanne Strutz. Roxanne has been a rising star in Toastmasters leadership ranks. This year, she has been serving her, la her final year as division director. In real life, she's a professional dog groomer and runs her shop in the same building in Puyallup for 28 years. And as many of you know, I had, as many of you know, have been, and many of you have been customers for nearly that long. Whoever has dogs does not do cats. She's also blossomed into an excellent storyteller. So, ladies and gentlemen, Roxanne Strutz. Thank you, Mr. MC. My story to tonight has been used as one of the tests for the SATs in 2016, 2017. However, it is an older story. The, sto the story I will be giving will be the blackbird and his wife. Once upon a time in the land of India lived Mr. and Mrs. Blackbird, high up in a tree. Every evening and every morning they would sing their songs. The songs were so beautiful that if you listened, sounded like gold and silver falling into your ears. One day the king came by and he heard Mr. and Mrs. Blackbird singing. And he said to his servants, fetch me the book, Mr. and Mrs. Blackbird, that I may put them in a cage and put them in my room, that they will sing me to sleep at night and wake me in the morning. The servants set about trying to capture Mr. and Mrs. Blackbird. They got Mrs. Blackbird, put her in a cage and took her off to the palace. However, they did not catch Mr. Blackbird. Mr. Blackbird was so angry that anyone would try to take his wife that he decided to create and declare war 
on the king. Getting ready for war, he went to a thicket and pulled the longest, sharpest thorn he could find. He bound it to his belt as a sword. He took a walnut shell, broke it in half. One half he made into a drum, the other half he put on his head as a helmet. When he was ready, he started his march. Rat-a-tat-tat, rat-a-tat-tat, rat-a-tat-tat. As he went down the road, he came across Fox. Fox says to him, where are you going, Mr. Blackbird? The king has stolen my wife. I have declared war on him and I will get my wife back. The fox said to him, I too have aught with the king. He chases me and hunts me. I will go to war with you. Whereupon Blackbird said, crawl into my ear and we will go to war. When the fox had settled into Blackbird's ear, he started his march again. Rat-a-tat-tat, rat-a-tat-tat, rat-a-tat-tat. Soon he came upon a line of ants. The queen of ants asked him, where are you going, Mr. Blackbird? The king has stolen my wife. I am at war and I am going to get her back. I too have aught with the king. He poisons us and puts boiling water in our nests. I will go to war with you. Crawl into my ear. Whereupon the queen of ants collected 10,000 of her soldiers and they crawled into the blackbird's ear, curled up into a ball and settled in next to Mr. Fox. When they had settled, the blackbird started his march again. Rat-a-tat-tat, rat-a-tat-tat, rat-a-tat-tat. Soon he came upon a rope that the, that the king had knotted up into a ball and had thrown alongside the road. And the rope raised up and said, where are you going, Mr. Blackbird? I am at war with the king. I am going to get my wife back. He's stolen my wife. The rope raised up and said, I too have aught with the king. He ties me into knots and throws me alongside the road. I will go to war with you. The blackbird says, fine, crawl into my ear. The rope untangled itself, crawled into blackbird's ear and coiled up into a, co a coil next to the ball of ants and next to Mr. Fox. When all had settled, Mr. Blackbird started his march again. Rat-a-tat-tat, rat-a-tat-tat, rat-a-tat-tat. Soon he came across the uh, bridge going over a little water. The water raised up and said, where are you going, Mr. Blackbird? The king has stolen my wife. I am going at war and I am going to get her back. Whereupon the water said to him, I too have aught with the king. He pollutes me and drains my waters. I will go to war with you. The blackbird said, crawl into my ear and we will go to war. The water crawled into the blackbird's ear, formed a pool next to the rope, next to the ball of ants, next to the fox. When all were settled, Mr. Blackbird started his march again. Rat-a-tat-tat, rat-a-tat-tat. Towards evening, he arrived at the palace and he knocks on the door rather vehemently. A servant came and opened the door and looked at Blackbird and said, what do you want? I am at war with the king. He stole my wife and I want her back. Whereupon the servant started laughing couldn't believe looking at this blackbird with a thorn in his side as a sword, a, t a small drum and a walnut as a helmet. So he takes the blackbird and he goes into the throne room where the king is. The king looks at him and says, what do you want? You have stolen my wife. I want her back and I am at war with you. Whereupon the king laughed and he said, take this blackbird, put him into the chicken coop tonight. He will surely be dead by morning. 
the servants did just that. They took him, put him in the chicken coop, closed up the doors, expecting him to be dead by morning. However, when the chickens came over to try to pet Mr. Blackbird, the fox crawled out of the ear and started snarling and snapping at these chickens. The chickens became frightened and they went into the corner of the room and they just sat there trembling. And anytime they tried to move, the fox snarled at him again. Come morning, the servants came expecting to find a carcass of Mr. Blackbird. They opened the doors again, and there was Mr. Blackbird marching back and forth, beating his drum. I'm at war with the king. I want my wife. I want war with the king. Well, they took Mr. Blackbird back to, back to the throne room, and the king was very surprised. You are still alive. However, he became angry when he found out that there were no eggs. He had no eggs for breakfast breakfast that morning. The king says to the servants, next time, put him in with the elephants. Surely the big feet of the elephants will kill him. So that night, the servants put him into the elephant enclosure, closed up the doors, and expected to find no Mr. Blackbird in the morning. However, when the doors were closed and the elephants approached, 10,000 ants and their queen crawled out of the ears of the blackbird and crawled up the trunks and up the legs of the elephants and started tickling them. He tickled them so badly that all night long they trumpeted, leave me alone, leave me alone, I tickle, no, no more. Well, come morning, everyone that had stayed awake all night long in the palace expected to find a Mr. Blackbird dead. However, what they found when they opened the doors was Mr. Blackbird, right as rain, marching back and forth, beating his drum. I'm at war with the king. I'm at war with the king. The servants took Mr. Blackbird back to the king. Now the king is angry because he had not had eggs for breakfast. And this was the second morning, no eggs for breakfast. And when he found out later, that the elephants refused to come out of the enclosure, that it would not work, he became even angrier yet. That night, he said, take Mr. Blackbird, put him in with the horses. Surely they will trample him. So the servants did that. They put him into the stalls of the horses, closed up the doors, expecting in the morning that Mr. Blackbird will not be alive. However, as soon as the doors were closed, rope crawled out of the ear of Blackbird and started to snap at the horses like a whip. And every time they would come close to Mr. Blackbird, the rope would snap again and become like a whip. The horses started trembling and they went back into their stalls and they would not come out. Anytime one poked his head out of the stall, the whip was there, snap, snap. The next morning when the servants came to collect the carcass of Mr. Blackbird, they found the horses in their stalls trembling. They were surprised. Mr. Blackbird, right as rain, was marching back and forth, beating his drum, rat-a-tat-tat, I'm at war with the king. They took him back to the king. The king is furious at this point. Number one, he had no eggs for breakfast. The elephants refused to come out of their compound to work, and now he had horses that would not come out for him to ride. He was so angry, he said to the servants, tonight, take Mr. Blackbird, bind him to my bed. I will stay awake to find out what magic this Blackbird has. That night, they did exactly as the king asked. They took him and bound him to the bed of the king. The king tried to stay awake, but he could not. When his eyes closed, water started coming out of Blackbird's ear. It covered the floor. After it covered the floor, it raised up a little bit higher and got the bed wet. Then it came up higher and it started to float the bed. The king woke up cold and miserable and wet. 
afraid he was going to drown because there was so much water in the room. He took a knife and cut the bindings of Mr. Blackbird and he opened the cage to Mrs. Blackbird. Leave, be gone, get out of here. Mr. and Mrs. Blackbird flew out the window. As they started to fly back home, as they went over the pond, the pond was magically full of water. When they went to the rope, the rope was magically there alongside the road. As they went over the area where the ants were, there was Mrs. Queen Ant and also all of the 10,000 soldiers. They also found Fox in his place. They finally arrived back at their tall tree. They, in the morning, as the sun began to rise, Mr. and Mrs. Blackbird started singing. And if you listened to their song, it would sound as if gold and silver was falling into your ears. Mr. MC. Thank you, Roxanne. Our next storyteller is Rosemary Sissel. Rosemary is the youngest member of the Fireside Storytellers League, yet has been enthralling audiences for many years with her energetic, passionate style. An incurable optimist, she admits, who doesn't shy, who doesn't shy away from the sometimes darker side of traditional tales she tells. Ladies and gentlemen, we're here in for a treat. Ro Please welcome Rosemary Sissel. Hello, hello everyone. I'm Rosemary and today I will be telling my adaptation of a tale from Not One Damsel in Distress. Now I uh, changed a lot of things about this story, but one thing I did not change is where it all began. In ancient Greece, in the middle of a forest, the forest of Catalonia. And it began with a woman, a princess, the princess Atalanta. Now Atalanta did not begin as a princess. She began as an abandoned child raised by a bear mother and three bear sisters. And she became tough and strong, running through the wilds of the forests of Catalonia. And news of this mysterious wild woman spread far and wide, all throughout the land. Everyone wanted to know and meet this tough, brave, strong, very mysterious creature of the woods. And she was not like a normal young woman in that day. Of course, she lived in the woods for one thing, but also she was possessed by a power that ran through her from the goddess, the goddess Artemis herself. Now, Atalanta was known far and wide for being tough and strong and brave. And before too long, she was invited, as people in those days were, to royalty. And as things just so happened, the king was so excited about the prospect of a young, strong maiden who ran in the woods with bears that he offered to adopt her. Now this king was King Iesus, and he gave her all of the finest dresses and the fanciest food and the craziest parties. And you'd think, you know, after living in the woods and eating roots and barely wearing any clothes at all, this would be a major improvement, but actually Atalanta was not very happy in the palace. You know why? The men. All of the dudes in the palace were so annoying. While she had been running in the woods with, you know, her mother bear and her three bear sisters watched over by the goddess Artemis, she didn't get to interact with that many men. And now that she was in the palace, they were a little bit annoying. Not to mention they had all sorts of ideas about what she should and shouldn't do. They wanted to control her future and her plans. They wanted her to get married and all of this stuff. And her father, well, adopted father, King Iesus kept saying, hey, come on, you need to get married and all these different tests and things that she needed to get done in life it was very tiring. And eventually he said, okay, you know what? You don't wanna do any of this stuff, but really young ladies need to get married. So if you just give us one test, one way that we can determine who's the right man for you, we can find that man, just give us, one, one single thing. And she said, okay, if 
find me a man who can beat me in a foot race. And so news, oh, my little brother knows what's gonna happen. You know the story. Okay, don't ruin it for the audience. They don't know. Okay, <laughs> I just really excited. I'm excited too, the foot race is epic. News spread far and wide and super fast guys, super tall guys, super tough guys, all the guys from all the different countries came and ran in this 500 yard foot race, but all of them lost because Atalanta was tough. She was strong and she was guided by the power of a God. So, I mean, it's, it's kind of hard to be the power of a God, but there was one single young man who came not just for the foot race, but also just to sit in the palace and observe for a while. This young prince was named Prince Melanion. And Prince Melanion was very taken with the young princess. He watched the way that she interacted with the men in the palace and he soon noticed how annoying they were, how they just sought to control her. And he thought, I understand what it's like. I understand how awful it must be. And the more he started to learn about her life and who she was and how insanely cool she was, the more he wanted to marry her. But unfortunately for our young hero, Prince Melanion, he was not very fast or very tall or very strong. And so what did he do? He went to pray at a temple of another God a god to rival even Artemis herself, the god, goddess, Aphrodite. Uh -huh. And he knelt and prayed all night and all day and all night and all day and just kept praying and praying about how much, you know, he loved this lady, he wanted to marry her, she was so cool, dudes are annoying, all this stuff. And finally, at last, dawn rose and there beside him, were three golden apples, each more magically sparkling than the last. And he knew that he had had his answer. And so he packed them away in a special fancy shirt he designed for himself. He was very fashionable. And he went to the castle, the palace, to challenge Atalanta to a foot race. And the foot race began and Atalanta, you know, she kind of recognized this guy. He'd been around the palace for a long time, very attractive, fashionable, all that stuff. And so she kept pace with him for the first hundred yards, you know, looks pretty nice. But by the, by the next 200 ish yards, she was realizing, you know, all dudes are annoying. All they want to do is control me. And so she sped up to get things over with. And that was when Prince Melanion threw the first apple. He was behind her, of course. So it soared over her head and the goddess Aphrodite herself slowed its descent, spotlighting it and all of its magical shininess as it fluttered to a halt some few yards off of the foot race. Now this was no ordinary golden apple. It was so shiny and sparkling that it seemed to dull everything around it in comparison as if it had been spotlighted by light itself. Now, like any human would, Atalanta was fascinated. You know, just a quick little detour couldn't hurt. And so she ran off to grab the golden apple. Now, by the time she had gotten back into the race, Prince Melanion was farther ahead. So she had to catch up to him. And then by that point, we were now like 400 yards into this 500 yard race. And she started to pass him and Melanion through the next apple. And this one soared over her head much farther a detour this time. And this one, instead of dulling everything around in comparison, it seemed to enhance everything around it as if the apple itself was multiplying the light in the world, saturating the very colors of existence itself. And now like any human at Atlanta had to go grab that apple. And so, you know, a quick little few hundred yard detour, she went, grabbed the apple, went back to the race. And by this point, <gasps> Melanion was fast approaching the finish line. And so she summoned all of her Artemis given strength and raced full out to the finish line. But right as she was passing Prince Melanion, just a few yards to the finish line, he threw the last apple. Now this one, this one was so bright that any sunlight that touched 
the outside of the apple, the apple's skin would burst it into flames. Little pieces of sunlight licking in flames off of the apple. And now what human could not grab that apple? And so Atalanta jogged off really fast, grabbed this apple. I mean, at this point she has an apple in either hand. So this one she just had to shove in her mouth and you know, a little bit of burns from the sunlight flames it was very exciting. And then turned and raced to the finish line and finished right after Prince Melanion. Mm -hmm. uh, spitting out the apple, dropping these beautiful, gorgeous pieces of magical goddess-given fruit. <sighs> she silently cursed the gods who had somehow managed to betray her by playing their god games. And Melania, very proud of himself and his smart trick, turned to her and then realized, uh, well, you know, Princess Atalanta, he said. I'm realizing now that by trying to trick you by throwing apples over your head so that you would be distracted and go off the beaten path, I may or may not have done exactly what you hate most about men everywhere, which is uh, trying to control you and also being annoying. And at that, ah, Princess Atalanta said, you're right, you are annoying and you do try to control me, but you know what, it's okay. I'm not gonna marry you, but we can be friends. And also these golden apples are really cool. And so they shared the golden apples and had lots of fun foot races and prayed to all of the different gods and did not get married forever and evermore. Thank you. Thank you, Rosemary. All right. Our next story teller is Linda Spadoni. Linda, like many of the fireside storytellers, grew up in a family of storytellers and has carried on the tradition. She's a retired school teacher who is lucky students were the beneficiaries of her, of her storytelling expertise. And tonight, so are we. Ladies and gentlemen, Linda Spadoni. Linda, there you go. You're muted, Linda. That's because the dogs were barking. Hello. I am going to tell a story that's not nearly as exciting as Rosemary's was, but it's about a little boy named Pigocino. And it is an Italian folktale that my nonno used to tell us. And the dogs are gonna make noise. Anyway, there was a little boy, oh, c'era una volta, a little boy named Pigotino. He lived in a small house at the edge of a small village in Italy. And he was not a boy who liked to work. But one day, his mother was cleaning house, a very small house. And she said, Bigotino, Bigotino, come down from your loft and sweep the floor for me. Oh, mama, I am too tired. I can't do that today. Well, mama wanted him to do something. So she took a coin out of her pocket and she rolled it over into a dark corner. Clinkety, clink, clinkety. Oh, Picotino, I have dropped a coin out of my pocket and it has rolled into the dark corner and I can't see it. If you come down and you can find it, you can have it. Oh, that was very tempting because they didn't have very much money and he did not very often get something that he could spend for himself. And so he came down slowly down the ladder and he went over into the corner and he looked and he looked and he couldn't find it. And he said, Mama, I can't find it either. She said, well, maybe if you take the broom and you sweep that things in the corner over into the light sunlight by the door, you will be able to find it. So that's what he did. He took the broom and he pulled all this stuff over the, in front of the door. And in that bright light, the coin sparkled and he could find it and he put it in his pocket. Well, three corners later, the floor was clean and Pigotino had four coins. 
And he said to his mama, mama, can I go to the store and spend my money? And she said, well, if you will sweep that pile of dust out from in front of the door, out onto, onto the ground, you may go to the store. So he did that. And then he walked very slowly up to the store, which was mostly like a fruit stand, and showed the coins to this, uh, the fruit vendor and said, what can I buy with these four coins? And the fruit vendor said, oh, you're in luck because we just got in a shipment of oranges and they are very ripe and very juicy. And with those four coins, you can buy two of them. So Pigotino looked at the oranges and he thought, well, oranges, you have to peel them. And that's a lot of work. Plus you can't eat the peeling. So that's a waste of money. No, I don't want the oranges, he said to the vendor man. And the vendor man said, well, how about a peach then? Peaches are very good and juicy. And Picotino looked at him and thought, well, you have to take the peelings off a peach. And there's that pit in the middle that you can't eat. So that's a lot of work and a waste of money. And so one fruit after another, apples, bananas, melons, had suffered the same fate. Each one of them you had to do something to, which was work, and something that would be wasted. So he didn't want any of those. And finally, the store man who was getting kind of impatient said, well, 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 how about figs, Pigotino? Figs have seeds in them, but they're crunchy and you just eat them. And you don't have to peel them, you just eat them. And Pigotino said, yes, yes, that's exactly what I need then. So he got four figs for four coins. I'm sorry, I'm bouncing around, but that's because a dog is over here. And he took them home slowly and climbed up into his loft slowly and lined them up on his windowsill. And one by one, he ate them. But just as he got to the last one, he bumped against it and it fell out the window. Oh no, he looked down through the window and there was the fig down there in the dirt. And he thought, well, if I want to get that fig, I'm going to have to go down the ladder, across the room, around the house, pick up the dirty fig, go over to the well, pump some water, wash it before I can eat it. And that's way too much work. It's not worth it for that little fig. So he just left it in the dirt down there. Well, as time passed, the fig got kind of covered up with dirt and it rained and the fig sprouted. And in several months, there was a fig tree out there. Well, that was great. When Pigotino would finish his breakfast, he'd go out of the house, he'd go around the side, he'd climb up in that fig tree, and he'd just reach down figs and eat little fat, fat figs all day till his belly was round and full. What Pigotino didn't know was that up the steep hill behind his house, where the forest was, he knew about the forest, but he did not know that ogres lived in that forest. And just at the edge of the forest, there was a little house that had a man and wife or ogre in it. And Mrs. Ogre would look down the hill and she would see that fat little boy come out of his house every day and go up in that fig tree. And she knew that fat little boys would make really good stew because she's had one before. That's what ogres do, they eat little children. And so she said to her husband, husband, you go down and get that little boy and bring him up here and I'm going to make Pigotino stew. And the husband said, well, how do you expect me to do that? He's not going to come with an ogre. She said, well, you'll think of something. So he took a big bag and he went down the hill and he went under the fig tree and he looked up at Pigotino and said, Pigotino, Pigotino, my wife and I want to invite you to come to our house for dinner tonight. Because if you just once get to know us, you will find out that we're not so bad. And Pigotino thought about that a minute. And he, I don't think so, Ogre. It's nice of you to invite me, but I can't go because my mom and dad, my mama and papa, they are out working in the fields and I cannot ask for permission. And they don't want, let me to go anywhere without permission, without they know where I am. And so I can't do that. Oh, said the ogre, please, 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 won't you come for dinner? No, I can't. Well, Bigotino, I walk down here in the hot, hot sun and I need energy to go back up home again. Could you hand me a fig with your little white hand? Uh, no, but I will toss you one. So Pigotino picked an, 
plump fig and he threw it down to the ogre and the ogre fumbled it all big old deal. All dirty and oh no, I just stepped on it and it's just squashed. Can't you just hand me a fig with your little white hand? Well, for one thing, Picotino would have to come down lower and that would be, he would have to work to get down lower. To, so he said, nope, just put your paws out, put them like, like a cup and I'll drop it down there. So he picked another fig and dropped it down. And of course, that ogre fumbled it. Oh, I miss it. I am so clumsy, old Picotino. Now we have two of them down here, lovely big juicy figs, all flat and squashed and ruined. You don't want to keep throwing figs down into the dirt. Just hand me a fig with your little white hand. So Pigotino did not want to waste any more figs. So he said, all right, Ogre. You come over here and stand real close to the trunk and put one paw up as high as you can reach and hold it flat. And I will put a fig on your hand. And so Pigotino laboriously climbed down a few branches and he picked a fig, a smaller one this time and reached it down to the ogre's flat hand. And as soon as it touched his hand, the ogre grabbed Pigotino by the wrist and yanked him out of the tree and stuffed him into his big sack and tied the top closed and put it over his shoulder and started up the big steep hill. And up and up he went and Pigotino was a sack thinking, what, what am I gonna do? So they went about, probably about halfway up the hill. He said, ogre, ogre, you must be getting pretty tired. This is a steep hill. And I am a heavy little boy. So why don't you just stop and take a rest? You can just, I'm in this sack. There's nothing I can do about that. So just stop and take a rest. And the ogre thought about it. Yeah, he could do that. So he stopped about halfway up in a shade of a tree and he put Pigotino down and he lay down to go to sleep. And Pigotino through the sack. Ogre, ogre, you're snoring too loud. You're snoring too loud. Move further away. So the ogre rolled over a couple of rolls and started snoring again. Well, Picotino kept repeating that. Over, over, you're keeping me awake. Move farther away. So the ogre would roll over a few rolls and pretty soon he was far enough away that Picotino could barely hear his snores. So out of his overall pocket, he took his pocket and he split the sack and he crawled out and then he filled the sack full of rocks and he took some string out of his other overall pocket and he tied the cut closed. And then he turned the sack over so the cut side was down. And then he heard the ogre kind of waking up. <laughs> and so he just ran down the hill a little bit and got behind some bushes to watch to see what would happen. And when the ogre woke up, he said, all right, Pico, you know, I, well, that was a good idea. I'm rested now. So he took the bag and he slung it over his shoulder. <laughs> oh, Pico, you know, I think you've gained weight just in the sack itself. And off he went up the hill. And when he called to his wife, 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 I have Pigotino, I have Pigotino. Well, she had been preparing the stew. She had the nice hot um, water going and she had vegetables and things in it. And she said, okay, okay, you go and call the friends and neighbors and relatives over and we'll, and I'll set the table. And so off he went to do that and she set the table. And then the all the ogres came and they were all standing around this pot that was full of steaming vegetables and everything. And she said, okay, now, and she untied the top and she upended the sack and splashed down into that boiling water, went all, and boiling water and gravy and everything went all over the, all the ogres that were around there, into their eyes, into their hair. And they started screeching and hollering and they ran off into the forest and yelling at the back at the ogre people, you tricked us. We're not coming back here. That was mean, that was mean. So the ogre's wife asked him what in the world happened? And he told her about the stopping to rest on the way up the hill. And she said, oh, you fool. You let yourself be tricked by that fat little boy. Now, tomorrow morning you go back down there and you get him and you bring him up here. Without stopping, you make sure he's got, you've got him in that sack all the way up. How will I do that, said the ogre. You'll think of something, said the wife. You better. So the next morning, the ogre went back down the hill and he got under the fig tree and he looked up at Pigotino and said, Pigotino, that was not a very nice trick that you played on me. We were just inviting you up to be friendly. And we didn't, and he said, you to be friendly. 
putting me in a bag and carrying me up the hill was friendly. Well, we didn't think you'd come any other way. And we wanted to prove to you how nice ogres can be. Well, it's true he wouldn't have gone with the ogre voluntarily. So he didn't feel so up bad about the ogre. But the ogre said then, oh, Pigotino, then I didn't even get to eat a fig yesterday. Won't you hand me, at least hand me down a fig? So I'll get something for all my trouble. So Pigotino said, oh, ogre, I know what happened yesterday. Well, that won't happen again, said the ogre. It certainly won't, said Pigotino. I'll tell you what, I will toss you down a fig. So he tossed down a fig. And of course, the ogre did the whole thing with us fumbling and all that two more times. And Pigotino was looking at those smashed figs down there, all right. And he had given him some nice ones, too. So he said, all right, ogre, if you stand up on your tiptoes and put your hand up as high as you can reach with your palm flat, I will put a fig on your hand. And so the ogre stood up on his toes and Pigotino looked down and saw that he was up on his toes. But what he didn't see was that he had his knees bent. And so when Picotino came down the tree a little way and reached down to put a fig on the owner, ogre's paw, the ogre straightened up his knees, grabbed Picotino by the wrist and pulled him out of the tree and put him in the sack. And this time he did not stop on the way up the hill. And when he got up to the top of the hill, he called, wife, wife, I have Picotino in the bag. He is here for real this time. And his wife said, all right, you give him to me and you go off and try to convince our friends and relatives and neighbors to come back again. She said, I already have the table set. So she closed the door, barred the door and the ogre went off to try to talk the people, the other ogres to come back to have dinner. And she opened the top of the bag and she dumped Picotino out on the floor. And she said, okay, Picotino, you are going in the pot, but I don't want to put your clothes in the pot. So take off your sandals. And Pigotino said, what are sandals? And she said, look down those things on your feet. Those are sandals, take them off. I don't know how. What? A boy your size, you don't know how to take off your sandals? How did you get them on? My mama put them on and she takes them off me at night. A boy your size and you can't even put on your own sandals. I don't know how to take them off or I would. So she said, I'll show you. And she put up her, her, picked up her own sandals and she unbuckled one and she unbuckled the other and she kicked her off her feet. Oh, said Pico, you know, I think I can do that. So he reached down and he unbuckled his sandals and he kicked them off. And he said, see, I did it all by myself. And she said, you surely did. And now take off those overalls. Overalls? Yes, she said, those things that are covering up your body that have those fasteners at the top. I don't know how to get them off. I suppose your mother puts them on you. Oh, cool. yes, she does. She puts them on me every morning and she takes them off at night. I don't know how to do it. Well, said Mrs. Ogre, this is how you do it. And she unclasped hers and unclasped hers and shook it down. And she said, and then you just step out of them. Oh, said Pico, do you know? I think I can do that. So he unhooked his and unhooked the other side and shook a little bit and off they fell. Well, ogres, you know, are covered in hair, so it's not that, not that lewd. Anyway, then she said, okay, now take off your shirt. This is all I've got left. Is this a shirt? It certainly is, she said. I don't know how. How did you get it on? My mama put it on me and she takes it off at night. Oh, said the ogre, this is how you do it. And she grabbed the bottom of her shirt and she pulled it up over her head and flung it off to the side. I think I can do that, said Picotino. So he, and he pulled it off and he threw it off to the side. See, I did it. I did it all by myself. So you did, said Mrs. Ogre. Now, climb up on that stool and put your foot over the rim of that pot and hop in there. That's awfully high. I don't think I can do that, said Picotino. Well, you certainly can, said Mrs. Ogre. All you do is you step up on this little step and then you step on the stool and then you put your leg over the rim 
and I think I can do this, said Bigotino, and he shoved up Mrs. Ogre and she fell into the pot. And he lifted up the heavy lid and put it on top. And then he listened and he could hear the sound of ogres coming through the forest. And so he picked up his clothes very quickly and he ran around the back of the house and there happened to be a pole leaning up against the side of the house. And so he put his clothes on and he shinnied up that pole and he got on top of the roof. And then he huddled down across behind the peak of the roof. And the ogres came in, all the ogres came in and they said, oh, that smells awfully good. That does smell good, we're glad we came. And they sat around the table with the bowls in front of them and the big spoons. And they said, but where is your wife? And the ogre called, wife, wife, we are all here, we are ready to eat. But he got no answer. And he said, well, she told me earlier that we needed salt, so she may have gone to the store to get some salt. And so we'll just wait for a little while, see when she comes back. So they waited a while and waited a while and waited a while. And meanwhile, the stew is bubbling away and it's smelling better and better and better. And finally the ogre said, well, tell you what, why don't we just have a bowl of stew while we wait for her? We won't eat it all, we'll save stuff for her. So the ogre went ahead and took a big label, ladle and he ladled out stew for each of the ogres around the table. And they all started eating and slurping and slupping. Oh my, this is good. This is the best stew we've ever had. We're so glad you invited us. And I'm going to give myself a little shade there, I think. Nope, it didn't work. Um, we were waiting and waiting for the Mrs. Ogre to come back, but she didn't come back. And meanwhile, Pigotino is up on the roof, trying not to laugh too loudly. And finally, he can't stand it and he calls down the chimney, Ogre. Ogre, you are eating your wife. And the ogre sitting nearest to the fireplace said, did you hear that? Oh, said the Mr. Ogre, that happens all the time. That's just the wind blowing down the chimney. So they didn't think anything more about it. And they just went on slopping the soup and slopping the soup as a stew. And Pigotino was up at the top. <laughs> and so he calls down the chimney a little louder. Ogre, ogre, you are eating your wife. Did you hear that? No, we didn't hear anything they said because they were slurping so wildly. And so Picotino couldn't stand it and he called down loudly, ogre, ogre, you are eating your wife. And that time they all heard it and they ran outside and they looked up and there was Picotino on the roof. And the ogre was so angry, he couldn't think straight. Pigotino, Pigotino, how did you get up there? Well, said Pigotino, I piled up all the pots and the pans and the plates and the glasses and the cups and the silverware, and I made a big pyramid. And then I just climbed up it and got on the roof. Well, the ogre didn't think twice. He said, if you can do it, I can do it. And so he ran in the house and he got pots and pans and dishes and the other ogres helped him. They made a great big pyramid pile of everything that was in the house and the ogres started climbing up it and of course it all crashed down and the glass broke and spewed out and hit ogres in the eyes and the face and the arms and everywhere and they got speared with broken glass and flying pottery and um whatever and they ran off into the forest screaming and yelling and growling and they never came back well now picotino waited a long time up on the roof to make sure that they were gone for good and then he shinned in the pole and he went home and he climbed up in his tree and ate figs, finito. And I was actually told that story by my nonno, my Italian grandfather, but my dad would always sit, stand back and kind of laugh. And he finally told us when we were quite a bit older, he said, that's not the way he told it to us. He said, the way he told it to us was the ogre had to stop and take a poop. And Picotino would tell him, Ogre, ogre, you smell too bad. Go farther away, go farther away. But evidently he thought that either my mom's American lady's ears or our little children's ears were not, uh, we didn't grow up on farms, I guess. We weren't considered earthy enough for him to tell it that way. So he changed it to the snoring. And my dad just thought that was the funniest thing. Mm -hmm. So that's the epilogue.
Thank you, Linda. That's the most interesting Italian folktale I've ever heard. And you know what? My, my brother is really into looking up family history and he has been to Italy several times and he would ask people if they knew, had ever heard of Pigotino and they would say no. But then when he would tell them what the story was about, they'd say, oh, you mean Picotino or you mean Bigotino. They all had different names for him. And some of them had wolves instead of ogres and, or bears. So, but it is a traditional story there. Hmm. All right, thank you very much. And now our next storyteller is Joy Ross. In 1993, Joy took a storytelling class at Pierce College in Puyallup and uh, has been telling stories ever since. She's told stories in festivals all over the country and in 1999 was even invited to tell stories in China, touring with the storytelling group Ethnotech. Ladies and gentlemen, Joy Ross. You're muted, Joy. Thank you, MC. Okay, the story I'm going to tell you is one that's written by Debbie Maycomer and Mary Lou Carney. Now, Debbie Maycomer has written many, many books. She's a local author. And at one time, she had a yarn store, a tea room, and gift shop in Port Orchard. And many of us had visited that. The story I'm going to tell you is the truly, terribly horrible sweater that Grandma knit. Now, Cameron was racing home, just running through his mind three days, three days till my birthday, as he's bounding up the stairs to go through his front door. He is so excited he can hardly wait three days. He kicks off his soccer cleats and he's about to bend down and put them up on the shoe rack when he discovers a package has arrived. It's going to be from Grandma Susan. Oh, for his birthday, he picks it up, he rattles it. What is it going to be? Will it be a new video game? Will it be a remote control car? or maybe a flashing light for his bicycle. Oh, Grandma Susan makes the best gifts possible for him. But alas, he has to wait three more days. So he puts the package back on the table. Those three days are hardly hard to wait for, but he does. He awakens that beautiful morning, stretches and bounds down the stairs where his mother and his father and his younger sister are waiting to have breakfast with him. A huge stack of pancakes with candles on it is waiting for him. Oh, they sing for him. He blows out the candles and says, can I open Grandma Susan's package first? His mom says, yeah, sure you can. He goes and gets it, rips off the paper, pops it open. The card he's about to toss on the table. His mom says, no, no, no. You read the card, he reads the card, and it says a very special present for a very special boy. Grandma Susan is just the best. He tears open the inside paper. Well, there isn't a video game. There is not a remote control car. There is not a flashing light for his bicycle. There is a sweater, a truly terribly horrible, ugly sweater. His mom is so pleased. She said, look what grandma knit for you. And she holds it up to him. It's lots of stripes of colors with big buttons down the front. A truly terribly horrible sweater that he is never ever going to wear. She said, isn't this just nice? It's like the one she knit for your sister a while back. Well, if that wasn't a death knell to the life of that sweater. Oh, well, that night he goes off to bed and it rained that night. In the morning, he has an idea. He calls Scotty, the family dog, up to his bedroom. Scotty loves puddles and loves to roll in the rain and the mud. So he puts Scotty's front legs into the sleeve of the sweater, buttons it down his back 
and he's about to carry Scotty down the stairs and out to the backyard, which he sure is going to end that sweater. But his dad is coming up the stairs. Oh, son, Cameron, no, no, no. That sweater's to keep you warm, not Scotty. Besides it rained, it wouldn't be a good time to wear the sweater. So Cameron takes the sweater off the dog. All right. <sighs> and he puts it in his bedroom. A few days go by and his mother's fixing his lunch for him to take to school. And she says, today is going to be the perfect day for you to wear your sweater to school. It's just the right warmth. He puts that truly terribly horrible sweater on, buttons up the buttons and he heads out the door. Just around the corner of the house, he gets out of that sweater and crams it in that back bag. He is not going to wear that sweater in front of his friends and be laughed at. Close to Thanksgiving, there's another chance for him to find a new home for this sweater. His mother has been collecting things around the house that they no longer need to don donate to the church's rummage sale. She says, Cameron, do you have anything? Oh, yes, I do. I'll meet you at the car, she says. He dashes up to the room where he digs that sweater out from the very back corner of his closet, grabs a few toys that he really truly no longer plays with, makes a bundle, down to the car he goes, pops it into the trunk, shuts the lid, and waves his mom goodbye. Whew. That truly terribly horrible sweater that he's never ever going to wear is on its way. Except mom comes home about two o'clock in the afternoon. She said, oh, Cameron, look, I saved your sweater. I had no idea it was in there. Your grandma would have been so disappointed not to see you wear it sometime. Okay. So he takes it back up to his room. And that night, he has another idea. After everyone's asleep, he goes downstairs to the refrigerator in the kitchen and opens it up, lays the sweater out on the floor. Squirt, 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 ketchup, mustard, globs of mayonnaise, and scrunches it all around that sweater and throws it in the laundry basket. That'll fix him. Well, the next day, just before mom is about to go out to buy groceries, Cameron hears this screech that she lets out in the laundry room. Cameron, what happened to your sweater? I, I got hungry and I tried to fix a snack. I'm sorry. I don't know whether I can get it clean. Your grandma worked really hard at that. Cameron heard her say those words. He didn't want to hurt grandma's feelings, but that sweater was so truly terribly ugly and he wasn't ever, ever going to wear it. Off to school he goes and when he comes home that night, there's the sweater nicely, cleanly laundered, sitting folded up by his eating place at the table. And she said, I'm so glad I was able to fix that for you. Cameron says, yeah, and takes it back to his room. And he actually puts it on top of the dresser this time. Well, right afterwards, after Thanksgiving comes Christmas, he's helping his dad and his sister put up all the beautiful Christmas decorations. When mom comes in and says, I've got good news. Grandma is coming this Saturday on the train and she's going to stay the full two weeks through Christmas with us. Wow, Grandma Susan is just the best. She watches him for a long, long time, shoot baskets, shoot baskets and applauds every time he makes it. She lets him read stories to her. She plays all his board games with her. It's gonna be so nice to have Grandma Susan visit. Even when his mama says, you'll wear your sweater that grandma made you when we go meet her at the train station. Yeah. 
So there he goes with this striped sweater and those big buttons and off they go to the train station. Clear across the waiting room. Grandma hollers out and he yells, Grandma, Grandma, and goes running to grab the biggest hug ever and the first hug from Grandma Susan's visit. And she notices the sweater and she said, my, my, don't you look handsome? He didn't say much. The next morning, Grandma Susan came in and sat down on the edge of Cameron's bed. The sweater was on the floor and she picked it up and she said, let me tell you about knitting this sweater for you. You see that green stripe? That green reminded me of the soccer game I got to see you play. Remember you scored the winning goal and everybody was happy. Yeah, Grandma, you cheered the loudest. <laughs> yes, I did. And that blue stripe, that blue stripe, that reminded me of your beautiful blue bicycle. Do you remember last summer when your dad took the training wheels off? Wow, you were so brave and tried so hard all the way down the street until the, by the time you got to us, you were riding that bicycle upright just the way you should. And I knew then that boy is going to go far. The orange stripe? <laughs> the orange stripe, dear Cameron, is because I've never seen a boy who likes oranges as much as you do. I do, Grandma. Yeah. Tell me more. Well, the yellow stripe, the yellow stripe is a happy color. Happy the way we were when I got the call from your mom and dad that they had a baby boy. The best day of our life at that time. The red, the red is the color of hearts. You're in my heart, whether we're together or far apart. Yeah. Maybe that sweater really wasn't so truly, terribly, horribly ugly. And just maybe Cameron was going to wear it a lot for a very, very long time. Thank you. All right, thank you, Joy. And ladies and gentlemen, our final storyteller this evening is Brad Grinrod. Brad was introduced to traditional storytelling just three years ago, which he says completely captivated him. He's a longtime Toastmaster, short time storyteller with Fireside Storytellers League. Brad Grinrod. This story is called My Own Self, or Aencel, as it's said to be in an ancient Celtic tongue, which is a Northumbrian fairy tale collected by the folklorist Joseph Jacobs. And although uh, this tale is set in the north of England, I'm telling it with a West Country accent due to the rural character of both the story and the accent, which you may recognize is that of Agrid from the Harry Potter movies. So here is My Own Self, a tale that affirms the warning expressed in the age-old proverb, be careful what you wish for, as you just might get it. Once, not so long ago, there was a poor widow and her six-year-old son who lived all alone in a solitary stone cottage at the edge of a glen, away back in a lonely hollow, miles from the nearest town or neighbor. For this was the North Country, a desolate land of craggy hills, black water bogs, and rush pastures, where the will of the wisp grow in the moor grass. And on dark winter nights, so the old ones say, one can see the twinkling fairy lights dance in the glen. As well, the wee folk call upon each other out on the eath. For on those nights, the widow imagined she could hear their eerie chatter upon the wind. As well, the tiny fairy lights it blew would dance upon her very windowsill. Now, this might sound delightful to you and me in this time, but to those back then, it was a eerie portent, made all the more dreadful for the widow and her son by the absence of any kin or company. 
So soon after supper on such nights, she would stoke up the fire, then retire a bed straight away and pull the bed club so close up o'er her head. For no one knew it might be about what mischief lurked on the other side of the cottage door. And for pity's sake, she cared not a no. But such early repose did not suit her young son. Ed strong from birth, he heeded not his mother's wishes. Ere when she called him a bed, he would nonetheless go right on playing by the fireside as if he did not hear her. Then one night, that just at the forefront of winter, it was as such. And the widow well knew that this night, moorland spirits were bound to be about. For the wind was whistling fiercely with shrill fairy calls that rattled the window panes and tugged at the cottage door. Eya, the will was betwixt, and can they make up her mind to go to bed, leaving her young son playing alone by the fireside? So she tried to coax him. My son, she pleaded, won't ye come to bed? For the fairies are about this night. Yet safe you'll stay beneath the covers, for there they can't see ye. But the boy replied, nay, nay, I shan't, I shan't. Yea, though, the widow, the mother, was sorely fearful to leave her young son playing alone by the fireside. So she asked him once again, come to bed, my son. Then begged and finally scolded. But each time the boy replied, nay, nay, and shook his head. When at last she lost all patience with him and in despair cried out, well then me boy, if ye won't come to bed at once, the fairies will surely come this night and fetch ye away. Then what will become of ye? But the boy only laughed and Mockiner replied, well then, I wish they would, for I would like one to play with. And at that, his mother burst into tears, certain that after such words, something dreadful would happen. But the boy was unswayed and sat defiantly on his stool next to the earth, his back turned to his mother. So, seeing thus the futility of further pleading, the widow stoked up the fire beside her boy, and when she had it burning brightly, Sobin went off to bed. Now, the boy had not been sitting there long alone when he heard what sounded like a wisp of wind come whistling down the chimney. And when it reached the open earth, out popped the tiniest wee little girl you could ever think of. She was only this eye with wild silver hair and piercing green eyes, green as the Celtic sea. Oh, the little boy was delighted, yet look at her quizzically. Oh, my soul, said he, and what, pray, do they call ye? Whereupon the wee girl answered in an ancient tongue. I and so, she told him, which means my own self. Then the wee girl asked him, and what pray do they call ye? The boy started a say, then he felt a twinge of caution. So instead he prevaricated and told her, I'm just, I'm just my own self too. Just my own self too, the wee girl chirped. I replied the boy, just my own self too. And at that, the wee girl smiled and clapped her hands together. Watch this, she told him. As she scooped up an handful of ash from the fireplace and spit on it, then began to mold it in her hands into the form of a cow. And when she finished, she held it out in front of her. Do ye like it, she asked. I replied the boy. And the fairy child laughed. Eh? Yeah. That's just the start. So she waved her hand over the cow. And as she did, it magically came alive, mooing and moving around on the earth as if it was a real live cow. Bless my soul, gasped the boy. And I can do more, bragged the fairy child. 
So the wee pixie scooped up another handful of ash and spat on it, this time forming a little calf to accompany the mother cow. Then she waved her hand over it as before, and it came alive and moved about the earth. Then the fairy formed a farm for the mother cow and its calf to live in, and then a man and a woman to run the farm, and then a house and trees and fields and children laughing and playing, all moving and talking quite properly as real miniature people. And so the play went on for several hours until the fire burned down and its light upon the earth began to fade. So the boy grabbed a stick in order to store the glowing embers back up to make them blaze, when out popped one of the red hot cinders and perchance where should it fall? But upon the fairy child's tiny foot. Oh, she squealed, my foot, my foot, look what you've done, you've burnt my foot. Oh, it hurts, it hurts, ye naughty boy. Look what you've done, look what you've done. Oh, which continued, abated, until her squeals reached such a fever pitch, the boy was afraid it would wake his mother. When suddenly heard a rush of wind come roaring down the chimney. Not a wisp as before, nor a whistle, nor anything close. And gauging that what might be coming would not be tiny, nor friendly, nor coming to play. The boy boiled from his stool and ran swiftly to his bed, where he dove beneath the blankets in a desperate bid to hide himself. Whereupon he heard a voice coming from inside the chimney. Not a tiny voice, nor childish, nor timid, but craggy and, and shrill and, and formidable. Who's there? The voice demanded. And what's wrong? Oh, well, the fairy child, it's my own self, and me foot, it's burnt sore. Burnt sore, ye say? Came the craggy, shrill voice from inside the chimney again. I wailed the fairy child. Then the boy, who'd been watching all this from beneath his bed covers, suddenly saw the pale white face of a witch appear from beneath the chimney flue and look about the room. Well then, the witch demanded, oh, dead. Just my own self too, did it, sobbed the pixie. What, screeched the witch, returning her gaze to the child. If ye did it your own self too, then why ye making all this fash or it? And with that, the witch stretched out her long thin arm and grabbed the fairy child by the ear. Come hither, she snarled. Tis time ye left this human about. Then, Shaking her roughly, she pulled the fairy child up the chimney with her out of sight. Now, the boy had been watching all this through a people he'd fashioned from beneath his covers, and trembling, slept not a wink, for fear that the witch should return and snatch him up too. When at last morning came, and the boy cautiously turned out his covers and tiptoed over to the fireplace, the little people and the animals from the night before he saw were now just small piles of white ash that dotted the earth, which he left untouched. Then he went to eat his breakfast and set about his chores. Well, at night, his mother took notice that he'd been uncommonly well behaved the entire day, did what air she asked of him, including to her surprise, going to bed after supper without hesitation or complaint. Oh, at long last, she thought to herself, he's taken a turn for the bear. But it wasn't a so, only that he knew he might not get off so easy next time. A fairy comes to play. All right, thank you, Brad. And that's our show for tonight. 
I hope you were all entertained. I know I was. And now that we've entered our storytelling, you're all invited to stay online and chat with the storytellers.